Yes, it's me. Do not adjust your phones or laptop screens or whatever you're watching me on. It is the YouTuber formerly known as Anti-Bullshit Man. I did finally get around to changing my username a few months ago. I was supposed to do it in mid-2020, and then I just, for whatever reason, didn't do it till January 1st, 2021. Uh, I explained why I wanted to change it, so I'm not going to explain it now. I explained it in one of my videos in 2020 when I intended to do it. And then inexplicably, I just kept putting it off, like I do most things. So, yes, that's my new username, and you should click on this video because I'll put my name in the thumb, thumbnail. And, yeah, if you want to praise my decision, if you think the username's cool, I'll welcome that praise. Or we can just move along and discuss the theme of this video. Um, first of all, why am I doing a video? I've said so many times that it's better to just write out arguments and uh, rewrite arguments before you finally publish them. And you can't rewrite, or you can't re-say what you're saying when you're just doing one-take videos. So this is all a very horrible approach to communication. This is a horrible approach to persuasion. Um, but every now and then, I'll just admit, every now and then I do get a niche to just kind of rant. And today I'm especially full of piss and vinegar. So this is the sort of itch that writing cannot scratch. So I'm going to do a video. I watched a Douglas Murray clip. I often watch long Douglas Murray one-on-one -on -one interviews, but this is a clip from a full-length interview that I, I haven't seen. And this is one of those themes that's been going, bouncing back and forth almost everywhere. It infiltrates everything. It's about the privilege discussion. Uh, I may post at the end of this, because I know that the, the written version is going to be better than anything I say here, so I may post a written sort of overview about the pipeline, the, the privilege to brute bad luck pipeline, and how it needs to be connected more often. Um, and so I'll, I'll play the written version of that, that's a couple of years old now at this point that I wrote up on a video. Um, but right now I want to... See, Douglas Murray is one of these um, cast of characters with whom I can... Like two-thirds of everything he says, I don't just modestly agree, but I'm, I'm full on. He, he really articulates the problem with whatever it is that he's critiquing, uh, at, at least whatever uh, non-religious issue he's critiquing. The moment he gets on religion, he engages in all sorts of apologetics, and he's tedious from, from A to Z on pretty much any religious subject. So, with the exception of religion, with the exception of the, the, the God-shaped hole, right? He's, kinda, he's one of the people propagating this idea that people are losing their minds because the secular culture, and if we just kept up with devout theism or maybe uh, just aesthetic token theism, everyone wouldn't be losing their minds right now. They wouldn't be clinging to political ideologies. And I'm saying, if you're one of these people taken in by this argument, Douglas is made, Peterson is made, the, the God-shaped hole argument, you just got to do the quantitative analysis. You got to do well-replicated data-driven arguments. And you got to show that highly religious societies, historically, broad picture, haven't had populations that have been taken in by sort of political fanaticism, right? The, the levels of political fanaticism have to be extremely low the higher the level of religiosity is, and vice versa. The lower the level of religiosity is, your typical secular country, um, the higher the level of political fanaticism and um, all kinds of movement building, rhetoricians, winning the day, would have to be in those societies. And then and only then, if you can build this case, you can't just appeal to a few special pleading cases, a few outlier societies where you think that that may have been the causal chain as to lower level of religion directly le leading to higher level of political fanaticism. You have to actually show it as a pattern. And none of these people, even though they're met with such props, there's just such a hunger for so many, at least YouTube audiences, this kind of thesis. Yet they never do widespread kind of analysis of nation after nation, society after society, culture after culture, that shows that there's kind of a push-pull relationship between these two things. And Murray's sort of been at the forefront of that, and so that annoys me. But that aside, just about every other subject he tackles, like two-thirds, maybe, maybe three-quarters of everything he says... I am enthusiastically nodding along, and then the final third or the, or the final quarter of what he's saying, 
I just, I'm, I'm just so, I kind of want to, I almost want to throw up. That's how wrong I find it to be. So let's play this video. Um, I don't even see what the title is because I got my phone over the title and I don't want to lower my phone because then it may fall and I just don't want to kind of ruin the, the vibe if the phone falls. So I'll just play it, but it'll, it'll be linked in the low bar. Do you find it strange that we've been getting lectured about privilege from a prince and a princess? Oh, I think it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sometimes things just write themselves, don't they? Uh, uh... So I think this was in the context of the insanely over-discussed drama. Is the drama the right word? The, the fallout of Oprah interviewing Meghan Markle and her husband, Prince Harry. Is it Harry or the other one? See, this is just how apathetic I am when it comes to the, ro the, the, the royals. The only appropriate response to this is I don't care about the royals and I don't care about any sort of marriage involving the royals and I, I will hold the Brits to every bit as much scrutiny when it comes to this as I will hold non-Brits who may be galvanized by this topic. And a lot of non-Brits are. They're really into this interview and discussing the aftermath of it and yeah, it just really doesn't matter to me. The past ought to be dead, so if there was some sort of prestige or some sort of pe people think the past has to be interwoven to the present, and it just really doesn't matter for me. Um, the Brits are every bit as mistaken in thinking the royals matter to this extent, that we either have to be extremely upset if these allegations of racism are true, or we have to be upset in the event that they are false, in the, in the event that Meghan Markle is full of shit. And I'm saying, either way, it doesn't matter. They're human beings just like us. They piss, they fart, they shit. And you're never going to convince me that given how many nations have managed to do well, be stable, be prosperous without royalty, either royalty affecting the state legislature or royalty doing something in the way of aesthetics and theatrics. We've had enough nations now that have done okay without any sort of royalty in any sort of capacity. It's 2021, it's time to, I'm not saying anyone should agitate to abolish them even in their aesthetic role. I'm just saying the, the best way to show them, the best way to sort of thumb your nose at them is to not care. And that goes for both the individuals who are all, all the people who are really upset that it might be the case that there's racism and that Meghan Markle's allegations are true, or that the slander of Meghan Markle at the Royals being slanderous is something that the whole nation needs to be offended by. It's like, it's just another family. It's just another family. So yes, Royals impacting the state, the state legislature is bad, is worse than an aesthetic sort of royalism, but in either case, we gotta grow the fuck up. This is, caring about this is one of these biggest examples of immaturity. Everyone who's galvanized by this is to some extent immature. So, but this laughter is not, by, by them, is about something else. So they should really be laughing at everyone. There's no sane voices in this discussion. From Pierce Morgan to Meghan Markle herself, and everyone in between, whatever it is you believe, the fact that you care about this is an indicator to me that you might be close to a sane voice, but, but you're not fully sane. You're, you're too immature to be sane. You care about the wrong things. Um, yes, uh, the privilege game. I'm not into the... Yeah, so they're laughing about the privilege stuff. And I've been meaning to discuss this. I write about it not enough, but I have to discuss it in the video because there's been way too many videos, but I kind of just touch on it briefly. And now I want to give it a full treatment. Privilege game. Um, Playing back a bit. Yes, uh, the privilege game. I'm not into the privilege game, by the way, because I think it's, I think it's uh, irreducible. Uh, I, I, th I think it, you can't ever finish the game. Be uh, and can I explain why for a second? Because, please, please. Because, first of all, it, it shifts all the time in our lives. I mean, you may say, for instance... No, not all the time in our lives. Look at all the other policies that... Actually, you know what? I'll just let him continue because I'm. Uh, if I start listing all the other policies that are a waste of time, this video is going to be too long. Some people all the time in our lives. I mean, you may say, for instance, some people would uh, that if you are rich, 
that you have privilege. Well, you do actually. I mean, you have a form of privilege. You have you have a, you have certain advantages over people. It's completely irrelevant. There's two ways to make it relevant. So if we can demonstrate beyond reasonable doubt that your riches are the product of ill-gotten gains, then there's something to discuss. Secondly, whether or not your riches are the product of ill-gotten gains, you can have earned every single penny fully legitimately by any theory of what is legitimate and illegitimate when it comes to acquisition of wealth. Uh, but then, if you use that wealth to impact something when it comes to the state legislature and impact something to the detriment of some other group or individual, well, then it doesn't even matter whether we can't demonstrate that you did something that, that it's ill-gotten gains. Um, you ought to be taken to task for that. So, let me continue. Poor, but if you are rich, that you have privilege. Well, you do actually. I mean, you have a form of privilege. You have, you have, a, you have certain advantages over people who are poor, certainly over the very poor. And the classical view, when it comes to these advantages, is that it's all upside and barely any downsides. And I'm just going to speak briefly from experience because it's nothing easier than saving money, especially in the age of the internet. So many things that are so fulfilling and rewarding are available for free. And it takes a very sort of imprudential person to feel that they need to spend at the level that they earn. So I have just, the older I get, the less sympathy I have for people who work full time, they wish they didn't have to work as much, and then they just spend for on things that they didn't really need. Um, but the idea that, yeah, richness in and of itself is all upside. No, not if you look at stress levels associated with promotions and even associated with raises. It's been a long time since I've been offered a promotion. The last two promotions I've been offered, I turned them down. The one promotion I accepted, and this is one of those things that led into a, from a wage earner. I went from a wage earner to a salary earner and I had no idea what I was getting myself into because you're screwed. You get calls once you clock out. You got to deal with interpersonal drama. And there's a sort of, everyone needs to, everyone who's offered these types of promotions doesn't know, doesn't get encouraged to ask themselves, am I the sort of person who can just turn myself on and off? If, I'm, if I put in my eight hours, I come home, whatever call I get, I'm not getting told about something that I can just resolve ASAP. I'm getting told about something that I know is going to be there once I come back tomorrow. So then it's going to be hanging over my head. In my case, I am constituted in such a way that even if it's the sort of thing that I resolve on the fly, once that phone call ends, I'm still going to be thinking about it. There goes my evening. Just as long as it involves a problem after I've left work, but it's a problem that I've gotten a call about, and it's about work, and especially when it's about a sort of interpersonal conflict among people. It, it doesn't matter if I give the ideal advice. There goes my evening. I got a call about it, and I'm done. I'm going to be thinking about it until I clock back in, and probably throughout the day. And am I getting paid for that? And how often is this discussed? Just, I made more money. Well, I didn't need that money, and I demoted myself as a result of it. And so I'm just so annoyed, and maybe Murray would get this. I'm not saying this is kind of a counterpoint to what he said, but he did present that the richness thing is kind of almost, almost entirely a one-way thing. And it's not. Not when you incorporate stress. And that's not just when it comes to the promotion. That's, that's also when it goes to just clamoring for the prestigious job in the first place once you're out of the whatever prestigious institution that you graduated from. Because graduating for a lot of people is a lot harder than others. And no one tells them, are you the sort of person who is going to be okay throwing away half their youth so as to climb this scholastic ladder? Not so much the professional occupational ladder, but just climbing the scholastic ladder. Well, the first thing you've got to ask yourself is, are you a speed reader? And if you're not a speed reader, you're partaking in a rigged contest. Because the final grade is not going to reflect the fact that certain people can get that grade far easier than you on account of just one little cognitive gift, the gift of being speed readers or having a good memory, which in my experience, people with a good memory, it's not even, it's, it's another one of these things where it's not just one way. 
the reason they've got a good memory is because they have very little else that they've got going on upstairs. So new information stays without a problem. Whereas those of us who have to think about a wide range of things, well, yeah, it's going to be hard to memorize every new thing we read about as a one-off. And no one tells people when they, when they pretty much send them off to these schools, like no one tells them, well, how much do you have going on in your head right now that you're actually passionate about that's got nothing to do with this school? They just say, you need to go to this school because you're going to be materially far better off if you climb the scholastic ladder followed by the occupational ladder. Because then you're going to be rich. Well, what about your lifetime of stress? What about your lifetime of abandoning your path toward becoming a well-rounded person cognitively because they made you monomaniacal in the current age where everything is over-specialized and will continue to be over-specialized to the point where intellectuals can't even talk. If it involves cross-disciplinary specialists talking to each other, they use one word after another that each specialty, each domain-specific approach to the word is mutually inconsistent. And they don't even know because they don't do, they don't, they don't spend enough time in one scholastic silo if they're in their own scholastic silo, that's the scholastic silo they know. They don't even know how the words get used differently. So yeah, by all means, you can be a specialist, but it'll come at a cost, at, at just communicative costs. So there's just, I think all things considered, even if you could be greatly richer, the moment you have other ambitions that have nothing to do with material goods, you don't even have to have them that much. You can have them modestly. You'll still find that, that ugh, Monomaniacal pursuits are going to do you more harm than good overall at the end of your life. Um, so yes, richness can be a privilege, especially if you're a reckless spender, but it's very easy not to be a reckless spender. So it's very easy not to need to be rich in the first place at the cost of all these things that I just listed. Um, uh, if you are very beautiful, you've got a lot of advantages over people who are really, really ugly uh, or just plain. You know, I mean... You and even there, it's hard to know. See, it's just so many of these problems reduced to logistical barriers to whether or not we should, we should fling esteem onto those types of people. Because what if someone busted their ass 24-7 for a decade to look as good as they do? And now they kinda, they're kind of thirsty for some sort of affirmation and validation on that. Well, it is a lookism to give them that sort of esteem, but it's nowhere near as bad as someone who is constituted physiologically in such a way such that all they need to do is maybe walk a couple of thousand feet a day and that's all they need to do to stay good. And they have kind of um, just their, their muscle masses. They just have to put the most minimal effort so as to not look worse than they do right now. This throws a major wrench in any sort of attempt to critique lookism because we don't really see the background, the, the effort levels of individuals. Whatever else you want to say about lookist style privilege gets tricky because any random person we bump into who looks really good, who's got a really thriving social life or something else as a result of their looks, well, were they just gifted that genetically or did they bust their ass to get there? If they busted their ass to get there, whatever else we might want to say about that being problematic, it's not every bit as problematic as someone who was just handed it to them genetically. So all these issues, one wrench after another, and it is complicated. And again, it's not that Murray is downplaying that complexity, but there is nonetheless a way to, I'm nonetheless motivated to play devil's advocate with something that he's about to say right now. So I'll let him go ahead. You're going to have a lot of advantage in your life because of that. People are going to want to... Uh, and it's justified. The more someone who started out mediocre or below mediocre, below average, and then worked their ass off to be above average looks-wise, then, well, it's certainly not anywhere near as unearned or, or ill-gotten, right? We talk about ill-gotten gains monetarily, and then there's ill-gotten gains socio-sexually, right? It's not. It's it's nowhere near as ill-gotten if you actually busted your ass to do so, to 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 improve your looks. If that's one of your ultimate goals in life, um, so yeah, it shouldn't be. It's 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 dicey to refer to it as privilege for those individuals who didn't start out that way, but who earned it. And he's kind of intermingling it with all these other pri 
privilege typically gets used as this is something you're bestowed, it, something you haven't earned. And so often when it comes to lookism, uh, favoritism based on looks, it's hard to know who actually earned it, who didn't. It's kind of not hard to know when it comes to plastic surgery, then it's, it's probably obvious. Uh, but it's not like plastic surgery is painless. So even in, in the cases where you don't work for it, but you just get surgery for it, well, yeah, surgery is very painful by all accounts. You go to the testimonies, no one talks about how, oh yeah, I just recovered after a day. It's like, no, every time, it's a, it's, it's a different way of busting your ass. So it's dicey to just lump that into the privilege bucket the way your textbook identity politics type would want to lump certain things into the, the, the bucket that they want to advance. So that's kind of what I'm about to do devil's advocacy on momentarily. Uh, in here, uh, more, uh, you'll find it easier to find a mate uh, and a partner. Uh, often, if the sort of person is wanting to spend their life with you or, or kind of convinced you, convinces you that they want to spend their life with you based on that, those are not the sort of relationships that are going to bear fruit in the long haul. So I think that that may seem, at least in a roundabout way, more of a harm than a benefit to invite those types of people in your life based on superficial aspects of yourself. Um, so you really think that that's going to be... Um, the sort of men who get taken to the cleaners, if I may use a Manosphirian trope. Which is, despite being the trope, despite being over-discussed, they do, they do talk about it often, right? So they got the sort of woman that they wanted, and they're the sort of men, at least in their, when, when you listen to their testimonials, they're the sort of men who took Peterson's advice before Peterson was a phenomenon. They did all these little things, one rule after the next, to make themselves um, as desirable as possible. And then everything went haywire. And so if they said, if I could have had a do-over once again, I would have been a MGTOW from day one. Uh, a MGTOW from day one. So, yeah, a lot of things that seem advantageous turn out not to be. And that's why it's always... When you intermingle the privilege talk with this kind of talk that your typical privilege talking points powder tends to neglect... They don't know how to counter Douglas Murray, but I can counter Douglas Murray with the sort of counterpoint that I just made right now. And I'd love it if I would know what his response to that might be. Because you can make this sort of response, the, the indirect harms of these superficial things in the long haul, things that seem on the surface like they're improving your life, worsening your life in the long haul, because the, the, the mate you got in this case is a mate you got based on some of the worst shaky standards that you want to uh, cultivate your mate selection on, that you want to premise your mate selection on. Uh, but it's harder to make those kinds of arguments when it comes to the uh, textbook domination to uh, oppression, the, the, the domineering people versus the oppressed people axis, which is silly in and of itself, and we'll, we'll get to that. It's, it's reductionistic in and of itself. But at least you can't say that once uh, uh, the, the oppressed are no longer oppressed, it'll bite them in the ass in that society decades down the line or years down the line. And, and much more. There are lots of things like that which you could point to and you could say, that's a privilege. But you never do know what other things in that person's life might be going on. Like, do people actually think that everyone who's beautiful is also wildly happy? Oh, well. So he gets it, but it's not the sort of argument that I would make because I would always bring it back to what the Wokies would say because they've got a tightly principled counterpoint to what Murray's doing here. I've got a circumstantial counterpoint. They've got something that is just categorically unmovable. And what that something is, is they would just say that right off the bat, if it's structural, it's more important. If it's non-structural, it may matter to some extent, but when we're having political discussions, and this may be due to their definition of what is political, but also they have really poor memory because they forgot that decades ago their prior political allies, people that they kind of appreciate for having paved the way for them, uh, one of their hallmark statements was the personal is political, but now these sharp divides between the structural and the non-structural well, they kind of spit it in the face of that. But that's their principled counterpoint to Murray, is that what Murray's bringing up is non-structural. 
And I don't agree with that, even though I'm nitpicking, circumstantially, I'm nitpicking the, the, the points Murray's making against them about how complicated this all is. I am doing that, I admit to nitpicking. I can do that and at the same time take issue with their principled sort of objection to what Murray's doing here. Because not only would I say that the structural, non-structural divide is not of fundamental importance, I would take it even further. I would say the anthropogenic, non-anthropogenic divide is also not of fundamental importance. It matters logistically. Because my working definition of politics, the, the political for me, is a combination of three things. Logistical, organizational, constitutional. Whenever I say political, I mean those three things working in concert. Nothing else. So I'm not going to say these divides matter none, because we have to persuade people, and sometimes we can fail at that. If we fail to persuade, then our ambitions can only go so far. They can't go politically, because then we're making laws. And so we shouldn't make laws if we fail to persuade enough people. If whatever coalition we have is a French coalition, then it's just that's, that's what it should stay at as. That's what it should stay as. Um, whereas ethically, it doesn't matter how unpersuasive we are. The ethical views stay what they are. Our ethical prescriptions, which are the basis for why I'm saying none of these divides, whether we're talking structural, non-structural, anthropogenic, non-anthropogenic, right, the sources of harm, it doesn't matter whether I never persuade anyone that these things don't matter fundamentally, my ethical views will remain what they are. And certainly my evaluative standards will remain what they are. So, quick little example. Say that we find someone whose main goal in life is longevity. They want to live as long as possible. Other things matter, nothing matters as much as this sort of longevity. And so you give them sort of a fourfold scenario, where there's these four different timelines for the future for them. Okay, so timeline one, they get assassinated by the government at 85. Timeline two, they get murdered by someone they know, premeditated murder, at 80. Timeline three, they get killed by a drunk driver. So it's an agent still, but it's not a malicious agent. We can say it's a reckless agent, but it's not a malicious agent. Timeline four, they get killed or they drop dead due to natural causes at 65. So there's four deaths, one results in an assassination, the most potent structural sort of harm. If you're going to talk oppression, it's not going to get any worse than that being, for, for let's say he was a dissident late in his life, and he was assassinated. You're not going to get any more oppressed than being assassinated by your own government for being a dissident, an outspoken dissident. Timeline three, well, yeah, it's certainly an agent who is malicious, so we can still say that, at least to the extent that that agent is in no way affiliated with any government that he's living under, the person, him having been killed by this agent, as long as it's a personal beef that he's having with this person who killed him premeditatedly, it's non-structural, but it's anthropogenic. Likewise with being merely killed by a non-malicious agent. Far from structural, accidental, but nonetheless a reckless agent is the source of the harm. Final case, he dropped dead because of, let's just say, you know, cancer, cancer running in the family. So it's like, even, we can even say the structure was in his favor there because there was a bunch of nudges and, and recommendations and he was given every opportunity to minimize his chances of dying of cancer, but it just wasn't enough to override the fact that this is kind of a, a background effect in his genetics and the family has a long history of it. So he dropped dead at 65. Now, any, any sort of person who's obsessed with these structures of oppression and who thinks we need to allocate resources and time and energy to fix these problems first and foremost, that sort of person can't explain why this person with these four timelines should opt for anything other than the timeline where they are assassinated. The, the first timeline they should want to avoid is the timeline that has the most oppression in their own life even if it runs counter to their preferences, right? So you go with their preferences, the thing that they should actually want to avoid the most is the earliest death, 
which is not only non-structural, but it's also non-anthropogenic. He didn't get killed, he didn't get murdered, he didn't get assassinated, he merely died. But he died earlier than he would have in these other three timelines. People who are obsessed with structures of oppression, domination, marginalization, who just really fixate on this stuff, what's their answer to this sort of person? The answer is, your preferences are wrong. You shouldn't care about longevity this much. And you certainly shouldn't bring it with that sort of baggage and try to shape public policy in such a way so that uh, people like you are given any sort of leeway, are given any sort of a boost at the expense of people like us. People like us who would tell you that you shouldn't really be that concerned with timeline where you die at 65. That's a better future for you than any of these three ones. And we can do a tiered approach, but the point is, I don't think those are irrational preferences. I think it's perfectly rational for him to just prioritize longevity, even though there's far more interference, a gentle interference, in, the, in these other three timelines. And the denial of that, oddly, mirrors another political disposition that I've had issue after issue after issue with over the years, and that is libertarians. Libertarians of all flavors. So it's not about structure and oppression, but it's more about mere non-interference. So non-interference is a sort of ultimate political good. Mere interference is the ultimate political bad. Like when they use the word liberty, it's just a placeholder for non-interference. And constraints on liberty or tyranny, it just map onto mere interference. And it doesn't matter whether that interference is a sort of nudge, a regulation, things that line up with the individual who's been interfered with things that line up with their ideally rational global preferences, their lifetime worth of preferences, things that they can look on their deathbed as appreciating. That doesn't matter. So you simply ought not interfere because it's kind of either, either by the standard of some kind of disrespect or they can have, um, they can be a bit worried about the mere possibility. So even if a state doesn't, full-on interfere, a state merely having the ability, having the power in their legislative toolkit to do so. That's also kind of a, a civic republicanism threshold for what's wrong about unfreedom. It doesn't map onto libertarianism, but it's, it's in that sort of wheelhouse. Um, and yeah, it, it just completely fixates on the structural, and then especially is antagonistic to any sort of view that would say we ought to give at least some consideration to, not just to the non-structural at the policy level when we can when it's logistical to do so but also we ought to go a step further and give some consideration to the non-anthropogenic just these these brute bad luck negative effects on people's lives so it, it's really weird that the id poll people have far more in common with all libertarian theories, private property ones, collective property ones, common property ones. There's these different property schemes that undergird all these different types of libertarianism. Um, but yeah, all, what, what all flavors of libertarianism have in common is the, is the obsession with interference versus non-interference, placing that at the center of primary political goods, just as identity politics folk place the, these very narrow, oppression, domination, axis. And then there are intersectional brethren who, people forget this, but the intersection, intersectionality theorists did start out thinking that they're actually reacting to identity politics. And, and they were, it's just that they were, identity, they were reacting to orthodox flavors of identity politics, but they didn't fully eschew the mindset. It's just kind of, they made it kind of heterodox and they threw in stuff like ableism, which Okay, but they can't even get that right because they, they would allow ableism. They would think that the problem, the problem that the disabled have, the biggest problem in disabled people's lives is not that they're disabled, it's not that they have these handicaps, it's that we even think of them as handicaps or we think of them as somehow being worse. So it's actually the treatment by the non-disabled of the disabled, the way the non-disabled, the able-bodied, look at the disabled, that's actually the big problem here. It's not the fact that they were born with these handicaps. So it's kind of, even when they were just intersectionality, when it was trying to improve upon traditional identity politics, it actually just made it worse. Because when they added something like ableism, 
they just all, they again made it a completely an external thing. And I'll link to a, uh, I did a um, community post on this that I may play uh, at the end of the video along with the first thing I said I was going to play. I'll, pl I'll play out what I read, what I wrote. Um, because they, there's, a, there's a page on the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. There's an entry called Critical Disability Studies. And it's just mammoth-sized text advancing this sort of argument that there's nothing bad about being disabled. The only problems these people face are the kind of prejudicial attitudes of the able-bodied. And it's like, so well, then why not extend that to mental disabilities as well, as opposed to physical disabilities? And you read enough of it, and you see that they do! So it's like, I wouldn't be surprised if one day I find out that the thing that I fear the most, the thing that I would actually trade off as many of the other structural or non-structural bads to avoid, a little thing called chronic severe depression, once that plagues you, that is the worst sort of thing that you can find, that is the worst sort of circumstance you can find yourself in. I wouldn't be surprised if something in the ballpark of critical disability studies say that, oh, actually, there's nothing wrong with this too. This is not... A severe bad uh, it's non-structural <laughs> so like I would rather be critically depressed severely depressed all the time than deal with a society where I'm kind of a second-class citizen I'm like yeah sure you would live one day as a chronically depressed person and then tell me that does everyone actually think that the rich don't suffer anything actually let me just plug that out now the, the question then is what's your hierarchy exactly here like, does a rich person with a drug problem and mental health issues ever meet a poor person who's mentally well and physically well? That's a case by case that we got to ask people. It's very interesting to pose. It'd be nice if we can actually just live, live out those experiences and then judge it following 24 hours or a week in one, occupying one life or whatever, 24 hours or a week or, or maybe a month occupying another life and then just do the, do, do the comparison. We can't do that, but it doesn't mean that the, it's, it's a giant waste of time. This is ultimately why I'm responding to him, because he want to say, that seeing as how we can't do that, it's a, just fruitless to have the discussion. But there's so many other problems that certainly philosophers discuss that they keep discussing, even though there's no convergence, there's no consensus. As a matter of fact, the more they discuss it, even if they start out in a kind of, they have a subgroup that is, there's near unanimous agreement within a subgroup, despite the larger disagreement outside the subgroup. But then when the subgroup people talk to each other, the more they talk, the more they find out that, oh, actually, no, no, we, we diverge far, <laughs> far more than we thought we did, even among ourselves, even among our little subgroup. So yeah, it's damn near impossible. The more we talk, the more we raise issues, the more we raise obstacles and pose these philosophical riddles, the further away we'll be to consensus. But it doesn't matter, it, it doesn't mean that the issue is completely unworthy of our time. Sometimes it's fun to just discuss stuff because it's a sort of mental reward. You're just learning about, oh yeah, because five years ago, ten years ago, it would have never occurred to me to actually ask the question he just asked a second ago. And just the fact that it would immediately occur to me to ask these kinds of zigzaggy questions right now, well, it doesn't matter that it has no policy implications. What matters is that you find a certain kind of fulfillment and a certain kind of cognitive growth in just trying to line up these kinds of comparisons in the first place. I eat a poor person who's mentally well and physically well. I... Yeah, I'd rather be the poor person who's physically well and mentally well I might have a different answer if I occupied those two kinds of circumstances for a week or a month or something like that. Um, I might have one answer following a week and a different answer following a month. So it's all very slippery, right? You may have something that doesn't seem as bad in the short term, like the rich person's, whatever, um, alcoholism, addiction, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, that may seem bearable for a week, whereas poverty may seem unbearable in the short term but then those roles may reverse, give it, give it a month or a year, something like that. Why is it a waste of time to contemplate these things? It's dangerous if people jump to conclusions and try to craft sweeping policy based on it. No argument there. Um, so I just wish that he would just be clear about that. 
This is great as armchair analysis. It's bad as ideological boosterism. But you should say no to boosterism regardless. Because for boosterism to work, you have to oversimplify. And you have to prey on the Marks and, and the Fawners' uh, need for belonging. You need to speak in short sentences. You need to just pretty much sacrifice insight on the altar of impact. And you should never do that. So that should sort of be a given. When, when intellectuals are talking online, they should, the, the last thing on their mind should be, oh, will this, do, will this be in service of my agenda? Or will it be counterproductive to my agenda? Like if I, if I get a little too verbose, if I use specialized language, um, yeah, I'm just going to alienate people. Oh, I'm going to alienate people. So who cares? Alienate people. So yeah, this, this whole topic, if we add layer upon layer upon layer of different types of blights that can afflict a person, and we do kind of comparisons of that, yeah, probably the average person is going to say, what the hell of use is this for? And yeah, it probably has no use. But it's interesting as hell. Because I just gave you an answer. I think I'd rather be the poverty-stricken person with physical and mental health, as opposed to the most the richest person in the country who's kind of bedridden and has to go to the doctor all the time. I mean, I have no patience for doctor's appointments for like once every five years. I feel like it's too much. I don't want to do it. So yeah, this is kind of a slam dunk case for me. Now, maybe if you may be the poorest person in the country who's literally starving all the time, because I can only afford one meal every two days, then it would get sketchy. But if you just make me a kind of rank-and-file poor person, and, and you and for me to be the richest person in the society, I would also have to be the unhealthiest person in society, um, then I know that the decision would be very easy. Average poor person in a heartbeat. No problem whatsoever. And yeah, I would extend that to just deeply structural... Um, like, make me a second-class citizen, but give me good mental and physical health. I don't care. Make me a black person in 1950s Mississippi. It'd be dangerous. I'm not denying that danger. But if the, if the alternative is make me a white person in the 1950s Mississippi who is just pretty much bedridden, has no energy, and has to deal with a doctor every week, Doctor appointment after doctor appointment, whatever, I'm being put on some kind of medication, it's not working out for me, so I gotta retry new types of meds, and then you got the whole big pharma preying on you problem. Um, no fucking thank you. So yeah, I'm just, I'm just given, and I'm pretty sure in that case, that would stay. That would not be a temporally sensitive decision. I would choose that at 20 year old, 30 year old, 40 year old, 50 year old, doesn't matter what pocket of my life you catch me on, I would always choose healthiest marginalized person being structurally oppressed over the unhealthiest non-marginalized privileged person being structurally privileged insofar as the health to unhealth difference is mammoth. Slam dunk, very simple. So Murray just posed this as a kind of a waste of our time comparison, but I'm just so freaking ecstatic to be able to talk about this, to have someone to bounce off, someone whose audio I can bounce off these answers to. How is it a waste of time? It, it's kind of intellectual food to ask ourselves these questions. And if it doesn't have direct policy implications, who gives a fuck? Most of the rewarding conversations or, or uh, texts, essays, novels even, fiction, we can talk about fiction, it's, it's deeply rewarding to, to read through it. And it doesn't have a single, even indirect, policy implication. So what? Most philosophical riddles have no answers. It doesn't mean reading papers to try to answer them is a waste of your time. I, I, I did feel that way about a decade ago when I first started reading philosophy frequently because I would read a paper and I'd go, oh, freaking, this guy clinched it. This guy just clinched it. And then you s scroll a bit further down, you see, oh, there's another response and it's precisely to this paper. And then you start reading that philosopher's response, and it's like, oh shit, this guy's making good points. And of course, none of these philosophers, no one knows their names. But uh, yeah, so you do that enough times, and you realize that you sort of become conditioned to find out that 
is really about the sort of dialectical journey and certainly the epistemic journey. What ultimately matters is whether or not we have epistemic warrant to believe what we do, not so much whether what we believe and disbelieve is ultimately true or false. Truth and falsehood is a freaking gambit. But certainly epistemic warrant, that's a different story. So we shouldn't even be dissatisfied. See, I'm, I'm at a point now where I'm so thrilled when I read a paper and I think the paper clinches some argument. And unlike a decade ago, when I come across a new paper that does a fantastic job challenging that argument, it's not a drain. It doesn't just, I, I don't groan my way through that paper because it's challenging something that I read that I was really impressed by a day or so ago. It's like, oh, here's yet another way to grow cognitively, to incorporate this person's argumentative arsenal. And just people are nowhere near ready. People are just so invested in boosterism. Just, they, they come across something that they just, they're bamboozled by it, and then they feel that spreading that is the way to go. And that's, that's what public conversation is, certainly on, on YouTube and a lot of these populist intellectual platforms. So who can spread their bullshit better? No, it's not about spreading. It's just, just about learning. No one knows. Because you and that's okay. It's just worth finding out how other people would answer compared to you. You couldn't work that out. There is no way of working that out. What about day to day? What, what about somebody who seems to have every advantage in life and then crashes the whole damn thing? Are they privileged? Were they before? Are they after? And, and who has the time to work that out? Well, they certainly were. They crashed it because of some mistake, right? Prudential mistake, certainly moral mistake. You're not going to say someone who's personally irresponsible, who had it all, and then due to personal irresponsibility, which we grant, they didn't encode their brain. So in an ultimate sense, even personal responsibility reduces to luck versus irresponsibility reducing to brute bad luck. That is true, but it's still pretty much crucial to point out that, yes, a privileged person who loses everything they do because of their own mistakes and, and repeated failures, well, that in no way undermines the fact that we can say that they were privileged uh, versus someone else who does so through no fault of their own. So, though a free will skeptic would say, all talk of personal responsibility versus irresponsibility has no place in any conversation. No, I'm going to say it has no place in conversations that in some kind of, at least indirect way, want to implicate public policy. But yeah, you can say like it has, it has no place in like an armchair analysis, ultimate theoretical analysis, pie-in-the-sky analysis. Fair enough, I won't argue with that. But see, he, he didn't specify, like, how did you crash and burn? Did you crash and burn on your own accord, or was it something else that made you crash and burn? It matters to an extent. It's not completely irrelevant. And I think even free will skeptics should be willing to admit that. It ties back to the whole logistical thing. Public policy needs to be logistically sensitive. Ouch. I mean, we would have to be permanently asking each other how we were. I kind of do that. Well, not permanently, but I do it probably at least a couple of times a day. And then I try to bring it up to people who seem at least somewhat receptive to entertain these concepts, and I find myself disappointed more often than not. I know not to try it with the bulk, of, with, the, with the majorities, but every now and then you run into someone who it seems that they're up to the task of having a fruitful exchange on this sort of stuff. And then their responses are like one sentences, two sentences tops, and they think that they've said something insightful in a couple of sentences. And then I start talking in paragraphs, <laughs> if not dozens of paragraphs, and you can sort of see them start getting bored because you keep qualifying everything. And see, this is another thing that philosophy... Philosophy needs to come with a disclaimer. Before you start plowing into it, there should be a giant disclaimer saying, all conversations, if you actually master this, from here on out, the majority of your conversations or all your conversations with people, eh, you're not going to find them that compelling. Right? Because people are just not up to the task. Because if you actually make an impressive case for whatever you believe in, it's going to be very long. And the average person, and, and even the above average person, the highly above average person, is nowhere near ready to listen to uh, long syllogistic arguments in favor of something or, or critiquing something. 
they want to chat. And even if they're discussing big picture subjects, like five sentences tops, you string five sentences together, and then you should stop saying what you're saying, and you should let them have their turn. Because the little... Ex fun conversations are perceived as, as these little spurts of you say your piece that takes no longer than a minute then i say my piece that takes no longer than a minute and that's the idea of a kind of like an exchange of ideas like no no each person should go for at least like 10 minutes but i know that when i go for anything more than a minute i, I can send they're too nice to tell me that i'm boring them but i can tell that they're getting bored so just just culturally we're nowhere near where we need to be um and step one to get there is people who have no enthusiasm for philosophy that's very abstract and useless in a practical sense, people who have zero appetite for that and who are kind of hostile to that need to be shamed and shunned and ostracized. And it's impossible to do that because we're always in the mi minority. Humongous minority. <laughs> and they're in, in the vast majority, like a, like a super majority. Because even, even people who are probably smarter than me I'm not saying this makes me smart. I'm just saying this makes me dialectically experienced. Uh, but I know that people who have far more knowledge, maybe not far more knowledge, but, but certainly a marginal, marginally higher levels of knowledge about uh, the world, practical things, they're, they're just not equipped to listen to uh, properly qualified, caveat-packed arguments in favor of something, like these comparisons we're doing right now. And that's a problem. And someone as smart as Douglas Murray shouldn't be excusing that by saying, oh, because it's endlessly complicated, we shouldn't talk about it. It's fruitless. No. The liar paradox. Like, books have been written by philosophers to try to resolve the liar paradox. There's no consensus whatsoever. There's always counterpoints. It never gets resolved. Nevertheless, reading a book on the liar's paradox is someone who makes a freaking, just takes a mighty big swing trying to resolve it. It's a blast reading this sort of stuff. Zero practical value, but it's still a blast. To be answering each other completely honestly and frankly with up-to-the-minute information, we don't have the time. It doesn't have to be up-to-the-minute information. You're setting too high a bar. Time. We don't have the time to do that. Now, the result is we make certain uh, sweeping generalizations. Uh, That's where he really shines and, and excels when he articulates the danger of the sweepingness. And there definitely is a sweepingness penchant when it comes to his targets. Uh, but it's not confined to the people that he likes to go out of his way to target. Uh, but it's, yeah, it, it applies to them more, more than any other sort of grand coalition that he tends to not go after nearly as much. I'm reading his latest book, The Madness of Crowds, and I, I don't think he is as, as proportionate as I would like him to be when it comes to sniffing out the, the, the worst features of every single, uh, at least politically motivated, coalition. He's kind of, he's kind of, I'm, I'm not saying he's one-sided, but he's, he's not proportionate. Uh, you might make a sweeping generalization such as, I don't know, somebody who speaks like me is wildly privileged, for instance. We do that. We do that a lot with accents, particularly in the UK. Um, yeah, even that, if you weren't born with that accent and you worked your way to cultivate it and to be really convincing at it, I would say, have at it. Why the hell not? You put in effort. The problem is not so much that there's a personal benefit when it comes to uh, certain kinds of accents being highly esteemed and, and acclaimed and renowned. It's that if you try to be persuasive in some sort of high stakes policy debate and you are if you had just a polar if you, if you spoke with a twang nobody would have bought into your arguments whereas the only reason they did or the predominant reason for why they did is because you sound as polished as you do uh, and i think that it's that's not only true of accents that's true of an ability a person has to just be highly articulate um, most of the time when I see someone, when I hear someone talk about how someone persuaded them, and they point to that someone, they'll point to someone like Jordan Peterson usually. And yeah, Jordan Peterson is an extremely articulate man, and he is charming. He doesn't have Douglas Murray's accent, but he has that sort of charming, I'm safe. <laughs> Listen to me, I'm humble and I'm safe. 
And I think that does have the work for him. Some of it is just his knowledge of the world, but a lot of it is just the fact that he's extremely articulate and he has a kind of father figure way about him, the, the way he speaks. And, and that's, I can't even call it charisma, but it is a sort of charm that I think if he lacked that charm, he wouldn't have been nearly as uh, persuasive. Like, it's, it's not the book that made these people turn it around. It's his talks. And it's kind of, he's kind of struggling with the concepts as he's, you know, he's articulating them perfectly, but he's kind of struggling with it because he's so invested in whatever he's talking about. Um, and again, these people who talk about having turned their lives around as a result of reading him or listening to him, uh, I'm willing to bet like thousands of dollars that it's just placebo effect. Like 99% of the time, they think it's Peterson, but it's, or they think it's the contents of the book that changed their lives. No, it's just, you find the man charming, and it's just a placebo effect. And that's fine, as long as you're, you know, down to earth about that and are willing to admit it to yourself. There's, there's no way advice that drabby, and even in the new book that I went after in a community post, I'll link that post, zero, zero refinement of the old. It's just rehashing circa 2016-ish um, sort of rules-based advice. There are 12 more rules for life. Really? They're just rehashes. Mm. Uh, but then what do you do after that? You say everyone who's been to a... So yeah, I mean, the, the, the accent example is it, it can be dangerous, but not because a person benefits personally. It's because they have a capacity to be given certain kind of leeway. Their arguments are given a certain kind of leeway for stylistic reasons and not substance. And in the public square, it should be 100% substance. It should matter if you talk with the biggest twang in the world, if you're a hee-haw type, if you're a... I, I mean, I'm not saying I'm better, that I can, like, just because I'm able to explain that there's a problem with this, that I'm above it. Uh, there are people that I've actually failed to take seriously just because of their accent. I'll just be fully on the record about this. If you've got a thick Indian accent, if you've got a Ugandan accent especially, I just find these accents funny. And I'm sure that I would have listened to more podcasters who are Indians or, or Ugandans or something like that who talk about serious subjects. I'm sure I would have gone back to that if I just didn't, didn't find those accents funny. And I can't overcome it just because I'm aware of it. It plagues me. Um, so like, this is one of those easier said than done things. I can talk about it till I'm blue in the face. I'm not going to be able to surmount that prejudice I have. Though prejudice may be a strong term because I don't... I don't diminish those people's personal worth. I just, yeah, I fail to take them seriously. And I'm sure that at the implicit level, if someone like Murray says the exact same thing as someone like, pick your random Ugandan speaker who is in the public square and making arguments, if they make an identical sort of argument, I'll be far more persuaded by Murray. To, to the extent that the argument is at least somewhat substantively impressive, I'll still take it far more seriously when it's coming from Murray. But that doesn't benefit Murray personally. It may benefit his agenda personally. Um, it just kind of shows that we should all just write all the time and never do this speak to the camera thing because it just activates biases. To deactivate biases, we have to move away from a spoken medium to a written medium, like the best intellectuals of yore knew to do. Even once the radio came out, most intellectuals knew to correspond in written form both because the, the arguments are best when they are slowly constructed and also because you deactivate biases when you just see the cold hard text. And we're so far away from that right now. With each passing year, more and more people flock to these written... And even YouTube is better than some of the sites that have come out in the last few years. Like, TikTok, as, as bad as YouTube is, TikTok? The average person has to they do graphics and all the other kind of gimmicky crap. So even just talking in a kind of animated way is not enough. You gotta infiltrate the talky talk with graphics and all kinds of wide-eyed. You can turn yourself into like an animal with the graphics, and it's just—it's so disgusting, just how open people are to gimmicks and how easily gimmicks capture their attention to the point where even YouTube can look good by comparison. Certain universities, particularly for a bit, well, they've got a type of privilege. Uh, what about people who've gone to university and they're the first people in their family to? into university are they privileged where exactly do they land in this 
Yeah, I mean, so if I knew at least one person in my life who has hang-ups or some sort of axe to grind because they weren't accepted to an Ivy League school, some kind of prep school, and that's what ails them, you know, I would take this seriously. But, like, I, I, I've never met anyone. They have all kinds of grievances about their personal life, personal circumstance. It's never because they weren't accepted to a prestigious institution of higher learning. Never. I can't think of one single person. Can you? Dear viewer, tell me, do you know someone who just kept applying and application after application was denied? And that's why now they're really upset. And this is why Michael Sandel's latest book on, it's called The Tyranny of Meritocracy. See, Michael Sandel assumes so much comes down to professional success, which, again, ties back to scholastic success often. And, and that's why he's like, he thinks that it, the title is justified, or even just the title makes me want to gag. That if we do reach a perfect meritocracy, the people who fail will have failed perfectly. And we can't have that because they'll be resentful. So we got to kind of placate their resentment. We got to actually say, no, no, you are. You are God's gift to the, to the world, even though you, you, you failed, at least in this domain of life. So he's kind of creating a moral panic. And I, would, I wouldn't call it a moral panic if I could think of at least one person whose main gripe with their own life is the fact that they weren't able to advance career-wise, job-wise. So do you know people like that? Or do you know far more people? If you, even if you can name some, is it not the case that you can name far more people whose main gripe in life has to do with something that is kind of closer to non-anthropogenic in its source? Something like severe depression that the more people listen to Sandel and, and Daniel Markowitz with his book, Critiquing Meritocracy, the more they fixate on these, the, the idea that just people put all their eggs into this one basket, the occupational basket, and how well they do on that, the more we're going to fixate on that sort of problem and direct resources to fix in that by, I guess, abolishing meritocracy so that no one feels bad for being left behind, and the less resources we'll spend on fixing big pharma or something so that people don't have to go through a bunch of freaking different uh, meds and antidepressants to cure issues that are far more serious in gravity because they make them suicidal. Like, I've, I've known people who've been suicidal for decades because they are afflicted by something that's just a product of brute bad luck. Where are the books being written about that? We have book after book after book that, that zeroes in on one or another non-anthropogenic or sorry anthropo either anthropogenic or structural problem even though i think if you just do a measure i don't think you're going to find that like the average black person like even even if you grant the thesis that <laughs> america is still a white supremacy whatever i'm not adjudicating that in this video but even if you grant that like how many blacks are suicidal or non-whites are suicidal because they're living in they're, as non-whites they're living in this white supremacy no, you can just say it's, it's a, it's a non-trivial problem, but it's still nowhere near the most severe problem that we can direct public resources to solving, to some extent. I, I, I just can't believe that someone as philosophically literate as Sandel, I haven't finished the book, so maybe he tackles this objection, but he hasn't tackled it so far, I'm three chapters in, doesn't even give me any indication that he is cognizant that someone can marshal this kind of, this kind of critique against his basic assumptions. Give me the, the cold, hard data. Give me the raw data that suggests people are really upset over the fact that some people advance in their careers and others just can't catch a break. And, oh, no, I'm stuck in a dead-end job. Like, the best decision I made is put myself in a position where my job is a dead-end job. And I don't mean to do this typical mind fallacy thing where I model other people's brains off of mine, but I'm saying I have assessed people that I know and that I know of online, and I just never hear them just on again, off again, talking about, no, I can't get a promotion, I can't get a promotion. If meritocracy didn't exist, I'd be better off, because I wouldn't be resentful of the people who do get promotions. No, it's just not at the forefront of their list of concerns. So how can someone, that I, I do respect Michael Sandel, I do respect Daniel Markowitz even more. These people that have mounted these critiques against meritocracy, 
I, I respect them so much. They know so much. Their knowledge is vast. But yet they can't figure out just the simplest things. If we're going to direct resources to something, it should probably be the sort of thing that people are like causing people to either off themselves, which I guess then it's over, so then we don't have to worry about it because their pain is done, or they try to off themselves, or they're at the verge of offing themselves. And I think depression is at the forefront of that. And it's not something that's not fixable. It's not it's like, a, it's a insurma depression is an insurmountable problem. No, a lot of people are put through hell in an attempt to get themselves on the right meds. And if we directed more resources in research and development to get Big Pharma to get its act together and to not be exploitative on this, yeah, we can have a sort of Manhattan Project for curing or reducing rates of depression. That's like the... If you're going to have a hobby horse, that might as well be your hobby horse because that's the most severe harm that like a, a non-trivial number of people face. Where are the books written about this? How many more books will be written about, titled something in the ballpark of The Tyranny of Merit? I was like, how many people? Like, I, I don't know. I don't know if anyone will comment on this video and say that they can count on more than one hand the number of people who are upset with the fact that they live in a meritocracy and they're not, they're not merited particularly. So we need to do away with meritocracy so that all these people who are unsuccessful, at least fiscally, financially, get to feel better about themselves. I don't think any... I think even if this video miraculously went viral, you, you wouldn't be... My phone died, which was actually good timing because I said seconds before it died that if this video went viral miraculously, and no, that's actually the last thing I would want to happen because of, it's taken me a few years to figure out, but now I know that it's a blessing. Low traffic is a blessing. High levels of traffic messes you up, messes up your thoughts, makes you think you got to respond to every last thing it's just bad had a small dose of it a decade ago i realized just how much it worsened my own thinking day to day just kind of feeling that you're you're on the attack so scratch what i said when i said miraculously no <laughs> one of the worst things that can happen another reason to be against boosterism is because you gotta want to go viral and just nothing corrupts people's thinking from what i'm seeing than when they're when they get hit with high levels of traffic and it kind of just um, condition themselves to have to you have to just ignore a lot of what comes back at you which inevitably means ignoring some of the good stuff when it comes in waves so even the most constructive criticism if it's just in the middle of smack in the middle of a bunch of not so constructive criticism you're going to kind of want to you're, you're going to inevitably be prejudiced towards if all you're getting back is most of the time suboptimal criticism so that's why popularity on the internet in these intellectual circles it's just it's, it's cancer for uh, good cognitive functioning and, and fairness and principles of charity um so i forgot where i left him off at but i'm just gonna play this next clip and so i i think it's a really unpleasant game to play and it's again it's reductionist it doesn't understand the complexity of us as people or the variety of ways in which people go up and down in their own line. Yeah, but the same could be said for totalitarian regimes, could it not? Uh, you haven't shied away from doing comparisons of, um, remember you did a big, long presentation style, uh, almost documentary style video, making the, the, the gist of it was there's an equivalence between fascist and communist regimes, or just the, the big two. Um, so that, that's kind of an equivalence, which means kind of doing a comparison. So what if we were to do it cross-temporally? What if I were to take contemporary North Korea and pose the question, is it worse or better than Soviet Russia at the peak of Stalinism? So if you kind of opened up that Pandora's box, then why can't I take, take it a step further and compare some other? totalitarian societies that are not these go-to cliche ones and say like well, which one's worse than the other right does it matter if we find out that just on the books they've got more like North Korea has more intrusive laws and Orwellian laws uh, but the people of North Korea are actually they don't feel that their day-to-day -day is as intruded upon as the people of Soviet Russia did at the peak of Stalinism 
See, that's not so much a waste of time as it is just an interesting way to think about it. You got to kind of pluralize the standards for what is worse, just laws on the books or how people experience the totalitarian society day to day. If I had to guess, you put a gun to my head and I'll guess, well, I'll say North Korea is worse. Of course, I don't know if North Koreans' day-to-day -day experiences of their totalitarian society is worse than that of Russians during the peak of Stalinism, but I just use that as a sort of hypothetical. So, should we shy away from those kinds of just intrastructural comparisons of just how bad things can get in these actually existing societies, whether past or present? No, we shouldn't. So if we shouldn't shy away from that, why should we shy away from non-structural or non-anthropogenic standards for badness? Yeah, the answer is we shouldn't. We should be cautious and we shouldn't be eager to politicize, but we can talk about it till the cows come home. Uh, and when I went for my four timeline thing, I, I watched the clip back and I uh, didn't specify the age in, in timeline three where he is killed by a drunk driver, I didn't specify that he is killed at 70. I actually meant to divide each timeline by five years, but then for some reason when I said dies of cancer, natural causes, at 65, that kind of made me... So initially, the four timelines were supposed to be assassinated at 85, murdered at 80, killed by a reckless drunk driver at 75, is what I wanted it to be, and then dies of natural causes at 70. So I wanted five-year differential between each four, each of the four timelines. And then I, I forgot to mention the age in timeline three. So maybe I'll insert a graphic. So this is just in case you don't watch this video, you're only listening to it. Just, just to clarify, timeline three did have an age. I just forgot to say it because I'm just doing this on the fly, which is why I shouldn't be doing it on the fly. Um, but yeah, so assassination is the worst structurally, but personally, insofar as that person has ideally rational global preferences that have to be respected, and those reducing to longevity, why should he care about what's structurally the worst thing? No, he should opt for that worst case scenario structural timeline, because he gets to live the longest in that timeline. I just wish I hadn't forgot to list the age in the third timeline death, the, the reckless driving death. Dave's. Um, but watching members of the Windsor family indulging in this game is, is remarkable because, of course, in, it's such a precarious game for them to play. I wrote about this when, uh, um, the... Do we actually know what their motives are? Should we be that confident that they're playing a game? Maybe they genuinely believe every word that comes out of their mouth. I mean, would you stake your life on the line or something extremely valuable on the line? Right? You can make a modest gain by being correct about their motives, but then the costs, if you're wrong about their motives, are astronomical to you. Would you make that bet? If you wouldn't make that bet, don't speculate on people's motives. It's just bad from a well-poisoning standpoint as well, when we do it to people we interact with, and we do it all the time. We love to speculate about people's motives. And so just if you actually had to make your beliefs pay rent, as the people on Less Wrong wrote all those years ago, and if you actually something was actually on the line, none of us would have this much the, the pretense of knowing what drives our opposition. That would go away quickly if we actually had to put something valuable on the line in terms of accuracy, inaccuracy, and if it were provable. The Sussexes uh, start. That's all I'm saying. I'm saying I, we, I don't know whether or not they're playing a game with this or whether they genuinely believe it. That's the humble way to go about it to doing this i think last year in uh was it vogue magazine or gq or one of the other bibles of the intelligentsia uh, uh um uh, they did a uh, do we know that that's also the case i mean at least the highest brow of intelligentsia because even within intelligentsia there's the low brow mid brow high brow so at least like maybe the mid brow as well as the high brow definitely the high brow that's not their go-to they have something much better something in the way of uh, one of these encyclopedias of philosophy or an encyclopedia of something else but the standards are better than than those two so you shouldn't be you shouldn't portray the intelligentsia as a kind of monolithic borg uh, and i say that someone i say it as someone who is well outside intelligentsia and kind of likes it that way uh, an article uh, in which harry started whispering on about uh, 
uh, instinctive bias and uh, uh, un, uh, uh, implicit bias, but neither here nor there. Unconscious bias and racism no. and so on. And then they started getting into a variety of other things. I thought, well, I know where this is going. It's the same boring playbook that, that so many other people have been rolling off in our era. It's contradictory data when it comes to that, first of all, having an impact behaviorally, if you have those kinds of biases, and then whether attempts to correct it go well or badly. Uh, most of the data is in on it going badly because of just how bad the first round of attempts at correcting it have been. It's just mostly patronizing these, um, oh God, I'm not going to get into that, the seminars on correcting implicit bias. Yeah, that's all just, just completely wrong-headed. But if you did it in a somewhat more productive way, where you don't just treat people like they're four-year-olds who are attending the seminar, um, yeah, you just might actually get those, whatever negative behaviors may exist as a result of those implicit biases, you may actually be able to correct for them. Uh, the experiment has just started being underway, and so we shouldn't be, again, eager, eagerly closing the book on possibility to fix it. So I'll use my own um, implicit bias or, or even overt bias that I'm aware of when it comes to the accent point that I made. Yeah, if I could attend a seminar and make myself completely just, just weed out these biases and treat a person who is more impressive but who doesn't sound more impressive because of their accent better than I treat someone whose accent is more impressive but whose arguments are nowhere near impressive, why the fuck wouldn't I want to take that seminar and filter out the, the non-substantive impacts on my judgment and evaluation. That's all win if I can attend that seminar. And if you wouldn't, then you're prizing something over judgment, pure judgment. You're, pri you're prizing some sort of parochialism or comfort zones. And yeah, I'll say it. It's fucking disgusting. And I don't care if you want to lump me in with the Wokies by telling you that that's disgusting. That is an intellectual mistake. Doesn't necessarily have to be a moral mistake but it's definitely an intellectual one. If you can weed out all your little biases and therefore vet information better, and you refuse to do so because of reasons X, Y, Z, little personal nuggets of prejudice that you kind of have some affinities with, why should I praise that? Why should I do something other than condemn it? Softly. But as I said at the time, watch out, Harry and Meghan, because this ends with the privilege discussion. Yeah. And it's possible. I mean. Well, I think I've been very clear as to the shortcomings of the privilege discussion, and that is the opposite of privilege. The, the, the strongest version of the lack of privilege and being oppressed has to, at least in principle, open itself up to being put on par with brute bad luck. And they haven't granted that theory. And, and I, I don't know if he would grant that. If he has some smackdown argument against the privilege talk, it may not even be hospitable to my critique that I just outlined right now and that I just kind of summarized again right now. So I'd love to be able to get into a one-on-one -on -one with him, but maybe not because then I have to deal with high levels of traffic and who, who, the, who the fuck needs the headache? Put it no stronger. It's possible that the second son of the heir to the throne uh, is not going to win an attempt to be seen as lacking in privilege. Now, there's a few ways in which he could do so. I mean, again, let, let's play this very unpleasant game that we're being encouraged to play. You could say, well, he has grown up as the, uh, as a, I think, the third or fourth in line to the throne, and uh, this makes him very privileged. That's true. You could then say he lost his mother when he was very young, so he then loses a certain amount of privilege because he... Again, devil's advocate, you're talking about the Wokies. You should anticipate why they wouldn't be open to that point because losing one's mother is not is, is non-structural and you can explain to them why they shouldn't be so quick to neglect a harm like losing a loved one. Um, but at least you gotta, you got to reveal to them, if you're trying to persuade them, that you're aware of what kind of an objection they would launch against you lumping all these things in with the word privilege. Their premise will not accept that as a diminishing of privilege, losing a loved one. They're wrong, but you've got to explain to them why they're wrong by acknowledging that they would not buy it right right off the bat, on right right from the get-go. 
he deserves a certain amount of sympathy, and he does, I think, for that. Absolutely. But then, how far do you take this, and how exactly do you weigh it up? Yeah, so how exactly do you weigh up the rank ordering of totalitarian societies from best to worst? Should we just throw our hands up in the air right off the bat because it's difficult? I'm sure there is a right and wrong answer for that. Um, he is uh, attractive. He's had Not a right and wrong answer, but uh, a ranked answer to that. A sort of take a scalar approach to weighing up the, the betterness and worseness of totalitarian societies. Very difficult, but I'm sure that if an oracle came by, they would be able to give me an answer. At that advantage. I suspect that if he uh, looked less attractive than he did, he'd have found fewer women throwing themselves at him, had fewer sexual and marital opportunities. But even if he was very unattractive, he would have had the advantage of who he is, and a certain number of women would still have thrown themselves at him. Yeah, and then again, I'll just reiterate the point about being taken to the cleaners. Hang out in the all sorts of weird corners of the manosphere more often, Douglas, and they'll talk about how well, uh, re realistically, whether he is sought after for being a royal, for being high status, or any of the other things in terms of attractiveness, uh, you, you'll find an enough sob stories from enough of the Manosphereans who've gone full-blown MGDAO as a result of these bad dealings. And then they'll make these kinds of, you know, uh, the, the curse turns out to be a blessing points that are, like I said, they're tropes, but they don't seem statistically insignificant despite being tropes. So I'll pay them some attention in this kind of discussion. For the pleasure and privilege of becoming a princess. Um, so, so this I'm having the worst time trying to wrap this video up. I've had to move to Audacity to just do an audio recording. Uh, even though I removed the recorded files from my phone, transferred them to my laptop, so the phone should not have space issues now that those long files have been removed. Just the fact that I recorded so much, I guess, has confused my phone, and so I can't record with it anymore. I've deleted a bunch of apps too after removing the video files that I recorded and the phone still registers it as being completely full. So I have to buy a camcorder from the looks of it because this phone doesn't, it's, it's not, it's, it's been over a day now and it still won't let me record even though I keep removing stuff from it. Just, just I guess because of the fact that I recorded such a long um, thing leading up to this. But I have to wrap the video up too so I'm just going to do it in an audio form because I did promise to read. Uh, what I wrote about uh, privilege a while back, uh, and I'm not going to read the whole thing because this has just been so long. And uh, Murray was done too, so I didn't really hang. I, I didn't really leave him hanging. He was just about done too. And I've said, I think, just about everything I want to say about his clip. Uh, maybe I had a couple of more remarks, but it's all, it's all trivial. So I'll just move on to the comment that I said I would read. So I write, and, and this is far better than anything I've said. This is far clearer. Than anything I've said before. Uh, I wish that everyone who draws attention to privilege would specify whether or not they believe that the distinctions between being privileged versus being just plain lucky are intrinsically relevant. If you believe that they are, you will probably find it far more important to focus on victims of wrongdoings, even if this comes at the expense of bypassing those who have been harmed without necessarily having been wronged even when the harm endured by the latter group is orders of magnitude higher than that of the former group, and even when it brings the latter group's individual's living standards far below that of those who've been wronged. Uh, okay, maybe it's not that much more clarifying than what I said in the video, but I just felt the need to point out that this is, this is kind of my written thing. And you can read the rest of it. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing because I was long-winded there too. I'm just going to rack this up, and I will link to the critical disability studies and not read my input on it. I'll just link to the page itself so you can read how insane the page is yourself. My input on it is just pretty much me sneering at it, so it's not that productive. Uh, so that's it for now. I have to buy a camcorder because my phone is unreliable. So next video will probably be me recording with a brand new camcorder. So look forward to that in five months or six months or something like that when I finally muster the will to do so.